The Pittsburgh Steelers have to pick up the pieces after being utterly slaughtered by the Buffalo Bills, 38-3 in Buffalo, the biggest loss of the Mike Tomlin era. We're going to talk about it, how they pick up the pieces, how they move forward. Kenny Pickett in the offense, Matt Canada, Mike Tomlin, the Steelers defense. There's everyone that you can point around and talk about in this game. Breaking all of that down right here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. Be a year daily dose of all things in the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find the show on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you're watching this video on YouTube, hit the like button on the video. If you enjoyed, subscribe to our YouTube channel to get all of our daily Monday through Friday episodes. We thank you for making the Locked On Steelers podcast your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Just pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can win up to ten times your money on any entry. First time users get one hundred percent instant deposit match up to one hundred dollars with promo code Locked On. That's L O C K E D O N Locked On. PrizePicks.com. Promo code Locked On. All right, now that that's out of the way, Steelers fans. Oh, it was that rough. We all saw it. We all sat through it. Man, there was not much to be gleaned out of. There was a little bit of hope in the beginning there, a little bit of hope. The Steelers defense gives up a 98-yard touchdown. You're like, oh, this is going to be a long day. James Pierre fumbles the opening kick. You're like, oh, this is going to be a really long day. Steelers defense gets the stop. The Bills miss a field goal. Kenny Pickett leads a field goal drive, the first ever points on the, on, a, on, a, on the opening drive of the game this season. And everyone's like, whoa, wait a second. Maybe there's something here. And then the Bills are just like, yeah, forget about all that. But let's, let's get into all the things that went wrong here. I'm going to start. With, with the offense, the defense has a lot of problems. We'll get to them, though, because I there's, there's certain criticisms of the defense that are absolutely true. Other criticisms, I think, are going way too far. But we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. But the offense, I'm actually, if I'm, if I'm evaluating Kenny Pickett's play and how he stood in there in this game, I don't think that there's too much negative to pull out of it. There's times I felt like he abandoned certain things at the wrong time. There was like there was a third down where the Bills faked the blitz and he checked into a hot a hot read real quick that was short thrown short of the sticks when he didn't need to. That was there. But you could see just like again seeing the field, getting the ball out on time and in quarterbacks across the NFL, across Twitter, even Tony Romo was, was like, you can see there's something different ab- about him. Now, it didn't result in any success, but granted, this is the number two defense in the NFL for a reason. They are very talented. They get after you. But 34 of 52 for 327 yards. Now, I will tell you, if you had told me that Kenny Pickett was throwing the ball 50 times in this game, I was like, well, the Steelers are getting destroyed because they would they would not have let that happen had that not been the case. Um, but Crazy enough, the Steelers actually possessed the football in this game, which actually I had as a very important key to it. They had the ball 36 minutes to the Bills, 23-52. The problem was the Bills were just striking from everywhere. Again, we'll get to the defense in a bit. But with the offense, lots of questions about how you even move forward with this. There were times I did feel like Matt Canada was was with hamstringing the offense with running the ball twice early on, on downs. And some of them were RPO. Some of them were designed like, Hey, Kenny, is it up to you? Is it there? If it, it, you know, you know, you get the chance to hand it off or to, th- to pull it back and, and throw it. I do think that there are times you need to, it's good to use that. And I said, it's important to use that, but th- you know, using that all throughout a game, maybe too much because then you're, you're, you're putting it on, on Kenny that much. Sometimes keep orchestrating the pass. The Steelers are not a team right now that can bully anybody with the run and that's where i think matt canada's biggest problems there was that when you had when you had those drives the steelers they get that field goal drive awesome great and you know and it took over six minutes off the clock that's exactly what you needed to do and then the next three drives three and out three and out three and out now granted the second drive was on nobody but deontay johnson and i guess if you want to call zach gentry's hold uh you know a thing there and again i do think it was it was a hold by the rule, but it's one of those things where, like, man, the Steelers have been mugged 10 times worse than that for the past several years and don't get those calls. But it's like, OK, you fight past that. Kenny Pickett on third down, third down, you know, gets out, gets out of, out in space, throws the ball to an open Deontay Johnson. He has to jump up for it and it bounces right off his hands, almost intercepted. Deontay Johnson had a terrible game and we're not doing grades today. We always do grades on, on the Tuesday episode of the Lockdown Steelers podcast, but I'm telling you right now. 
his is going to be among the worst of this game. You cannot get paid wide receiver one money and have the day that Deontay Johnson did. Not only did he drop that third down pass, he didn't get his toe in on a potential touchdown opportunity. Didn't or two, I think, I think at least two touchdown opportunities. Didn't get his toe in just short of the just short of the goal line in another play. And sure, he finished the game with like if you're a fantasy owner, five catches, sixty yards, oh, 11 points, yay! It, this was abysmal on his part, and you were supposed to be the guy that picks up the wide receiver room, 13 targets, and you produce the second most yards out there. George Pickens, awesome, great. He's doing what he's supposed to do. But this was a game where you needed him to step up, Chase Claypool, five catches, 50 yards on night targets, not getting enough separation, uh, in my opinion. And some of the some of the situation was tough because it's, at one point it was just like, well, the Bills are up so much now that, this, that they know the Steelers have to throw it. But you look at those guys, Najee Harris, you know, look, 11 carries, 20 yards, not getting it done there. But again, the Bills, you saw it on the, on a lot of those runs, especially on that first drive after the field goal, when they tried it, when they tried to run the ball, the, the people making tackles on, on Najee Harris were safeties flying up to the line of scrimmage. Why? And it's, again, it's not about just lining up with eight in the box or nine in the box. That's not always the determining factor of how much a defense is keying in on you. But how, how aggressive do guys fly to the line of scrimmage when you're in the backfield? And when Najee Harris is back there, they're flying up there. Um, and it's just it's just it's just the case now. Ed Thompson, uh, a uh, he's a he's a photographer for Steelers now, where I used to work. He also works for Channel Four in town. You know, he brought up he thinks that uh, that Najee Harris is legit hurt. I, I do think that he's he's limited, and that's obvious. But still, there were there were opportunities. I think that when the Bills were flying up to stop Najee Harris to kind of keep the ball in the air. And I know that's asking a lot of out, out of Kenny Pickett, but. They had to find a better balance. They did not in this game, and it's alarming. But at least you know again, you're you're going up against the number two defense. But it's still alarming that you come out here, you lay this kind of an egg when there was at least some hope, some optimism, and say, hey, if Kenny Pickett's out there, maybe you got a shot. And again, that first drive looked solid. And uh, yeah, throughout the game, again, he he seemed like he understood what was going on, which is more than what you could say for Mitch Trubisky. Like if this was Mitch Trubisky, the Steelers might have been shut out. Like that was how that you you look back at all of his games and you see like man, like they were they were fortunate to get this play or fortunate to get that play. Uh, but you see, Kenny Pickett was kind of out there fighting, and he seemed like at times he was the only one on offense that was putting forth a, a good effort. I'll say George Pickens. I, I won't George Pickens. You no know, doubt George Pickens. I'll also say Jalen Warren had some good plays in garbage time, but again, that was the Bills' backups, and they were kind of like just backing off a little bit there. All in all, this offense need, needs to look at itself. They, there's people that need to step up. Someone needs to be a primary key, key playmaker for this offense. Someone needs to make plays. Pat Frymouth got concussed in this game. That's not a good look. Um, you got to be concerned about him moving forward. I believe that's his six, second concussion that he's had in his career, which that's also a bit scary. Um, but I think the biggest problem is that if you're Kenny Pickett, like when Ben Roethlisberger took him took over in 2004, Heinz Ward was the leader. He was there was no there was no doubt that he was the leader of the wide receiver group and he set the tone. Jerome Bettis was a leader in the huddle. You had Alan Fanning, a leader on the offensive line. Kenny Pickett's walking up in there and he's looking like he has to be the leader at times. Najee Harris can try to be the leader, but it's clear that you know as a playmaker they're swarming to him. They said we're going to take you away and you're going to force you to to win with this passing game. And the Steelers just aren't consistent enough. And that's going to be a problem. Now, granted, again, Bills defense really doggone good. And they deserve credit for that. They, I think the Bills, they played a great game uh, and they did what they were supposed to do. And this, they outclassed the Steelers. The Steelers are not in that class of the NFL right now. Um, and it might be some time until they are again. But you still have to look at this game and you still have to say, okay, how do you keep moving forward? What does Kenny Pickett have to do to, to pick the pieces up? I also think that you saw a glimpse of why I think the Steelers were really trying to hold back Kenny Pickett until after this stretch and they get to the bye week because they knew that, hey, you know, those are going to be some rough games to put him in. And there were some, some, some shots that Kenny took and not like, you know, shots like Quinn and Williams gave him, but like, you know, when he slid down and I won't say that the DeMar Hamlin hit was dirty because uh, one, DeMar Hamlin loves Kenny Pickett. Those two, those two guys are boys from their pit days. He just, he came in late. It should have been flagged. It wasn't. And that, that was the problem. I think Mike Tomlin put that the best way he could. Um, but you know, all in all, you look at those type of plays, and it makes you wonder: like, was this why they were keeping? They were trying to see if Mitch Trubisky could work out at least for the first half of the season, and then they bring in Kenny Pickett. Either way, there's a lot of problems, and it's clear Kenny Pickett can't solve them by himself. It's going to take some other players stepping up and being those leaders. 
And the question is, do the Steelers have them? We'll talk more about that in a minute here. We got to talk about the defense, of course, as well, because they were just as bad as the offense, if not worse. But first, got to talk to you guys more about prize picks. Of course, y'all know about prize picks. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. It's an, it's another, it's an easier way. It's, it's something that's sweeping across the country. Everyone's getting into because it's not your, your, your typical fantasy where you pick an entire team and then you're hoping to compete against a million people. And maybe you get lucky on two or three players. Instead, you're picking the players and they're all you have to do is beat the number that prize picks has set. What do I mean by that? Well, prize picks is played like this. Pick two to five players that you think have a beat on for the you have a beat on their day in, day in fantasy. Choose whatever you think that they'll get more or less than a stat. For example, if you thought that George Pickens would have more or you know more than 50 yards in this game, and you picked him to, to have that, you'd get your money back on prize picks. But you can again, you're doing two up to two to five players, and that gets you a chance to win up to 10, 10 times your money on any entry. You're not competing against others, you're just competing against prize picks. And they also do this for the NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, college sports, and much, much more. So download the prize picks app today or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That's L O C K E D O N locked on. If you deposit $100 again, prize pick gives you up to $100. Don't forget to use that promo code locked on L O C K E D O N at sign up for an instant deposit up to $100 on prize picks or prizepicks.com. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter. We're continuing to talk about this debacle against the Bills. And I will say this, Cam Hayward shows you why he's Cam Hayward. At the end of the game, you know, he's forcing a fumble at the goal line, giving the Steelers, a, a, you know, at least a chance to make it look semi-respectable, which it, it didn't. Um, but that's who Cam Hayward is. But everybody else, man, and I will say Levi Wallace did have a good interception and they tried to go after him a bunch in this game. But I mean, my goodness, this was just the utter slaughter that you didn't want. And I thought initially the defense was trying to hold up and do their part of the bargain. The thing with the defense is that you cannot give up the deep ball. You cannot give up the big plays. You have to force teams to beat you the long way as far as, you know, several completions, several first down conversions. And they gave up those plays in, you know, in spades. It was the, you know, the opening drive of the game. Steelers have the Bills backed up third and long in their own ter- in their own end zone. And Josh Allen launches a 98-yard touchdown pass to Gabe Davis. And it was purely just Trey Norwood biting up cover one. He thinks it's going to be a deep crosser. It's really more of a deep, you know, deep seam, a deep go route up the middle. And Levi Wallace was expecting help. He didn't get it. And that was that was a wrap. And Gabe Davis, as you see, is a monster, as is Stephon Diggs. And of course, Diggs caught another one on Minka Fitzpatrick. This one, less of a mistake on Minka Fitzpatrick. He gets he puts himself in between Davis and Allen, which is what he's supposed to do, and forced Davis to catch it one-handed and almost ripped the ball out. But Gabe Davis just too good. Again, this is what I was saying leading into this game. This Bills team, they're not no joke. They are very, very good and Super Bowl contenders for a reason, Super Bowl favorites for a reason. Um, and you saw that there. And also just Josh Allen, just the confidence that he has, the, the ability to read the field. He picked apart everything the Steelers were trying to do. And I was talking about this leading into the game, the secondary being an issue and those things coming up in this game. Um, you had Minka Fitzpatrick, obviously not 100%, but out there, he was the only thing that was really able to keep the Steelers afloat when they were able to get you know the occasional turnover or slow the, the Bills down. Um, you looked at you know Akella Witherspoon being out. Cam Sutton didn't finish the game. So then you had Josh Jackson, the guy you scooped off the practice squad, playing out there with James Pierre and Arthur Mollett. That's not the secondary that you were hoping for. Now you're back to the days of like Antoine Blake and – Cody Sensabaugh and all those guys. That's not what you, that's not what this defense was meant to be. Also, you're still missing TJ Watt. Larry Ogan Joby got hurt in this game. Terrell Edmonds was out in this game, and you're still missing DeMonte KZ. The, you know, it can't be the defense that you want, but that's in a moment where I think you still have to find some answers. Like some guys have to step up. Alex Highsmith. I will say Alex Highsmith and a lot of those guys up front were getting held a lot, but it's clear the NFL does not care about that. You have to fight through it. TJ Watt has found a way to fight through it. And I think that when he's out there, it kind of energizes everybody. It, it charges people up and people feed off of that to find success, um, you know, as they did in the first game of the season. But 
you know, it's clear they're not getting home. And a lot of those plays, you know, the secondary was getting hung out to dry by the lack of a pass rush. And then, you know, eventually they did crack and make more mistakes. Um, you know, and as the game rolled on, you know, there weren't much, much plays being made, you know, by anyone. And the defense has a lot of questions to ask and you answer for. And if you're the, if you're the coaches, you're sitting there saying, well, wait a minute. You know, this was supposed to be a defense that was coordinating that first week against the against the Bengals. They were able to call several different dis disguised coverages. They were able to call several different ways to say, hey, cover this up, go this way, fake this out. You know, I have to look at the all 22, which wasn't available, you know, right after the game. And I'm recording this right after the game. But. By my estimation, I don't think any of those, those sky, disguised coverages are happening anymore, at least in a way that's like creative. And I think part of that's because these guys don't, you know, aren't able to pull it off. And, you know, part of that is, I think, as the coaches, you guys got to you guys got to push that on the like, hey, the, the, the next man up mentality. You guys got to push that on. And there's no excuse for these guys. You still have to stop the run. You still have to find a way to at least be in position to force it to be perfect. Like there's some plays like like to me, especially the second Gabe Davis touchdown. That's like, a, you know what? They made a great play. That's what it is. Like you just like that just that just happens. But there's other times where you could have been in position and done something right, done something smarter to at least make it make them be perfect. Because let's face it, the Bills are a much better team than the Steelers. If you're going to win, you're going to need them to make mistakes and you're going to need them to force them to prove that they to, that they're better. But when you give them easier opportunities like James Woods, last touchdown run, even though the game was over by that point. But, you know, like, you know, Trey Norwood, when he's the deep safety on that first touchdown, if he just stays back and forces, you know, Gabe Davis to, you know, to, to have he helps he helps bracket Gabe Davis. It's a harder throw for Josh Allen. And maybe the, the Bills are punting from their own end zone to start the game and the Steelers can start with great field position. But again, all for not. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of different you know, situations that you're concerned about. Um, I will say this again, the defense was bad and they get no excuses, but I saw a lot of, Oh, so much for this hundred million dollar defense out there. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Let's, let's be real. If you're, if you're making that claim, you're doing so because you want to say, oh, wow, these are terrible investments. None of these guys are actually any good that all the, all that $108 million is on the field and they are terrible. That is just flat out not true. When you count up T.J. Watt, Larry Joby, Cam Sutton, Akella Witherspoon, uh, Terrell Edmonds, Demonte KZ, all the guys that would be out there, and I'm probably leaving out a couple more, um, you count all them up, it's like $40 million are missing. So then you drop down into the 60s, and then you're saying, well, wait a second, you know, that's actually like the 21st or 22nd most paid defense in the NFL. And that's the kind of what you expect out of them is mediocrity. So again, not an excuse for the guys on the field. They still have to step up. They still have to make plays, but to, to say, to say, to use that narrative to say, Oh, I'm going after, you know, management for making this, the call to sign these guys. That's a bit, that that's a bit much. You're trying to do too much there. What you can say is that other guys aren't stepping up. Devin Bush not stepping up. Miles Jack. I thought there were times he made some good plays. He had a bonehead uh, I, I, you know, penalty after a play that was just that was just dumb. He had, but he hasn't worked out. Uh, he wasn't able to mask up the problems. I think uh, Chris Wormley, Tyson Alualu weren't able to really fill in. I felt like DeMarvin Leal, there were times that I think he made some plays, but eventually, you know, he's a rookie. When the game started to get, you know, started to go the other way, it was tough for him to also make an impact. I also think Cam Hayward's a little overwhelmed, but you looked across the board. When guys go down, other guys have to step up. That's what happens in those situations when you talk about the next man up mentality. It doesn't mean that everybody, because here's the thing, people take next man up going way too far. It doesn't mean when you say when a coach says next man up, first of all, Mike, Tom, it's not just Mike Tomlin saying every coach in football ever says it. My dad said it when he coached high school. My, you know, you know your pee wee coach says it. Heck, your basketball coaches say it. your everybody says it. It's it's just the idea is just it, it's in all sports. It's a motivating thing to say, hey, if it's your time, it's your time. Get out there and do your best and play to the level that they that they ask you to. Um, you saying you saying all that doesn't change the fact that if that person's a backup for a reason and they're not as talented, there's still a problem there. And in those instances, like when someone's missing, you need other players to step up to make plays. You know, for example, Cam Sutton, I felt uh, last week against the Jets, stepped up with a huge interception. You need more guys to step up and make plays like that. You know, maybe not necessarily the backups themselves, but maybe not maybe Malik Reed not getting three and a half sacks like he's TJ Watt, but you know, 
maybe Devin Bush getting it, getting his hand on hand on the football a little bit more. Maybe, you know, Miles Jack stuffing the run a little bit more. Maybe you know, Larry Ugonjobi when he's healthy, you know, getting getting in the court, getting in the backfield and getting a sack, you know, and doing some of the extra things. Those things haven't been done by the Steelers. And you could point to a lot of things. You could point to the players on the field, but you can also point to Mike Tomlin, uh, uh, Brian Flores, and Terrell Austin and the when the things that they put together. Now, again, when it comes to play drawing and schematics and concepts and trying to counter things, you become more and more limited when the backups that you put in there are, are just that, the backups. And again, Trey Norwood is your fourth option at safety. And I think a, I, I said all offseason long, a big part of what was going to make this defense good, if it was good, was that secondary being healthy and together and communicating because you had all those veterans. But again, those veterans, Akella Witherspoon, gone. Uh, 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 Cam Sutton was gone in this game. Uh, Levi Wallace even left this game. I forgot about him. He got, he got hurt in this game. He didn't even finish it. So your top three corners are out. Your top, your two of your top three safeties are, are out. So now you're operating with basically your third string preseason group in the secondary. And yes, you're going up against Josh Allen with Stephon Diggs and Gabe Davis. You're going to get, you're going to, you're going to have some problems, but again, that's where someone else needs to step up and the Steelers haven't found that anybody. And now you're sitting at one and four with a lot of problems moving forward. And you still got Tom Brady next week coming up. You got the Dolphins, who they look like they're in a bit of dis disarray. But you also have the Philadelphia Eagles, who do not look like they are in a disarray. It's looking very rough. The Steelers could rebound from this. I will say that. I am not. I don't think it's all doom and gloom and that they're destined to have the number one overall pick in the draft because that's what they would have if the season started today. But there has to be a, a, a there has to be, a, I guess, a call to arms would be the, the, the phrase that I said about, you know, from the Steelers leaders, from somebody to make a play there. We'll talk more about that on the Pittsburgh Steelers in just a minute here. Um, so stay tuned here on the Locked on Steelers podcast. But first, we got to talk to you guys about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best the best protein bar out there because if you haven't tried their Built Bar Puffs, you're missing out on one of life's greatest joys. And guess what? There's a new flavor. If you're ready for for an awesome cookie dar punk a built bar puff yet, that's what you should go get because the cookie dough flavor is awesome. If you've ever had cookie dough, it's a great, it's great, it's awesome. But imagine if it was actually good for you. Cookie dough chunk puffs are light, they're chewy, they have a, like a light chewy texture, but they have real cookie dough chunks, and of course they're covered in 100 real chocolate, just like all other built bars. All the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. Plus, it's healthy for you. The cookie dough chunk puffs from Built Bar are only 160 calories and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. But run to Built.com right now to snag a box for you and for the family, and it'll be a perfect treat. Or you can find a really good hiding place and just hoard them all to yourself. Like all Built Bars, Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs are covered in 100% real chocolate, which means they're healthy and tasty. And they're made with collagen protein, which absorbs, absorbs, which absorbs proteins more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits for you. Eat, eat something that tastes good and is actually good for you. You're going to love the new cookie dough chunk puffs. Go to built.com, promo code LOCKED15. That's L O C K E D 1 5, LOCKED15. And you'll get 15% off your next order of built bars when you visit built.com. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter. Uh, we are continuing to talk about this debacle here. And again, I go back and I was going back over all the things I saw wrong offensively, all the things I saw wrong defensively. And I'm not here to say like, hey, cheer up, Steelers fans. This is going to get better. It might. And I will say that we've seen the Steelers get destroyed like this before. Maybe not this exact score, of course, because again, this was the worst loss of the Mike Tomlin era. Um, but like last year. You know, when they the way they lost to the Chargers, even though they fought back at the end, the way that they were losing to the Vikings, the way that they lost to the Bengals the second time, the way that they lost to the Chiefs the both times, you know, the, that was a team that got slaughtered a lot last year. Uh, but somehow they found their way to a winning record. And that's where I think that this I'm not saying this team is going to come back and fight back for a winning record, but I don't think that this team. I think this team is better than what it's showing right now. And I think part of its injuries, part of it's trying to find answers that they can't find. But there do need to be people that are held responsible for things. And Mike Tommy even said after the game, like, hey, no one's above, you know, being replaced. They're looking for answers right now. So you know, I think the Steelers are in a position where some people might not be starting the next game. And the question is, who do you put in their places? You know, if you're if you're the Steelers, you know, you look at the linebacker position. Are you putting Robert Spillane out there more? And I think that's a big problem. But maybe Mark Robinson, he looked good in preseason. And I'm not saying Mark Robinson is about to save your life or anything, but 
maybe, you know, you give him a shot with some of the problems that you're having up there. Defensive front, you know, some guys up the middle are getting their butts kicked. They're getting, they're getting, they're getting pushed back. You know, maybe you got to give other guys a shot there. Um, the wide receiver position, Deontay Johnson was in his own head again. And we've talked about this. I've talked about this for years on the Lockdown Steelers podcast. Deontay Johnson, I think, I'm not saying he's a mental case because I'm not saying he's crazy like Antonio Brown, but I think that he has some of the biggest self-confidence issues on the team because there's times when he's when he's fabulous and he's getting it done. And there's times that he's just making mistakes that I'm just like, it's hard to compare when you're great like this at this one hand to catch over here, but you can't get this play down and get this play done. And I think that that's it's stuff like that that you you need people to be consistent to show up. And that's again, that's not to say for a lack of trying for Deontay Johnson. If you follow Brian Batko from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, you know he was there at at uh, um, you know at Highmark Stadium in you know in Orchard Park, New York, and he was sitting there you know early before the game. And the first person on the field, like all of last year before he was paid, was Deontay Johnson working on his hands, working on things. I, I think his biggest problem is his self confidence, and he's having struggles there. But again, you add up all those things. You need somebody to take charge and be the big person in that situation. And if you're Mike Tomlin, it comes from being – got to be a little bit aggressive here. you got to find ways to, you know, give give guys like Miles Boykin a chance. You know, Steven Sims left the game in an eye patch, and that put the Steelers behind a, a, a return man. And Gunnar Olszewski, who was benched for Steven Sims in this game, crazy enough, he was led, led to be inactive. And then the guy that you made him inactive for couldn't even play much in this game. All those things add up to major problems. But this is where I think that you start to see the fortitude of Mike Tomlin. And you're going to have to see, does he step up in, in this in these moments? In the past, he has. If you remember, I think it was 2013 when the Steelers were 0-4. Uh, and everyone was saying do and gloom them. They fought their way back to 8-8. Eight eight. Not, you know, that not, not again, doesn't save the season in the sense that it makes them, you know, Super Bowl contenders or anything. But they fought back and they found a way to be competitive. It's Tomlin, almost every year he's been, I mean, 2019, no Ben Roethlisberger. They're 0 and 2. I think they were eventually 0 and 3. Um, you know, where they were 1 and 3, I think, just like they were this year. Um, but they were they were 1 and 3 with their guys out there. I think they were 0 and 3 um, with, with, with their guys out there. But still, Mason Rudolph, Devlin Hodges, you remember that year. They found a way to fight back, win some crucial games down the stretch that got them back to 8 and 8. I, you know, I'm not so sure that this team has the ammunition to do that. And again, that's not just Ben Roethlisberger because he wasn't there in 2019. Um, you know, they need TJ Watt on the field. You know, they need their guys to be healthy on defense. Again, I said all along, this team was going to be built on its defensive prowess on being able to create turnovers, get important stops and win certain and win the possession downs and keep the, and make it so that the offense didn't have to do much, even when Kenny Pickett eventually came in. They're not doing that now. They're getting picked apart. They're getting they're getting abused. And that is what and that's just the reality right now for the Steelers. Can they turn that around? Maybe when they get healthy and maybe they'll catch a break with some of these teams. You know, the the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they just beat the the Atlanta Falcons 21-15. And it took a crazy roughing the passer call on, you guessed it, Tom Brady that kept the the Buccaneers alive in that game. But, you know, again, I look at that and I say, hmm, you know. It, you know, can this Steelers team beat a Buccaneers team? And I know everyone's probably thinking, well, they can't beat anybody right now. You know, you have to look. Do they? Can they get a little bit healthier? T.J. Watt did have arthroscopic surgery on his knee, but it appears to not be serious. Arthroscopic surgery. I've had arthroscopic surgery. You can recover from that. You know, a lot quicker. We'll see how much. How much as they say, it might add one or two weeks to his return time. But again, I've said all along. I think they should wait. I don't care about the season. They should wait to get T.J. Watt back after the bye when they have a better sense that he actually is healthy. Uh, because there's no reason to risk him uh, for the, for this just just for this year when you might bring him back out and get him injured worse. Uh, but again, they got to find answers, and you know it might involve. I think they, they're trying to find answers. It's not like they're not trying to shake things up. Demarvin Leal played a lot of edge in this game where Malik Reed would be because they weren't happy with Malik Reed. But the problem is, is that DeMar DeMar Demarvin Leal had also been a good interior line guy for the Steelers at times, and. When you take him out of there, now you're putting in the guys that you that he was performing better than. And again, they're just slim right now with all the injuries they had when Larry Oak and Joby came out. You know, you're putting yourself, you're, you're running out of spots to actually put out there. And again, this comes down to Mike Tomlin. What's the message? What's the response? What's the resiliency from this team? And there's time I, I, over Mike Tomlin's tenure, they have been resilient every single year when they have when they have fallen down in the middle of the year and it looks like the season can get away from them. They found a way back. And I think part of that is Mike Tomlin's, you know, greatness at coaching. 
but this might be the year when he doesn't do it. But how does he respond? I think it goes back to his legacy. It goes back to his his, his history. Um, and I think it goes into, you know, showing how he's going to carry this team moving forward, how he handles Kenny Pickett. I, I've said before, I thought Kenny Pickett should have been in before this. I thought he should have been starting the Jets game. Um, you know, again, I'm not Mike Tomlin. I don't see this guy, these guys every day in practice, but I mean, we all saw that game, even though the Steelers only scored three points, that was a that the, the Steelers offense actually moved the ball. And the problems with the offense weren't Kenny Pickett missing wide open guys left and right. It was Deontay Johnson dropping it. The Bills just being a good defense. Uh, you know, and there were a couple of times Kenny Pickett made mistakes, but they were more acceptable mistakes. 327 yards again, 34 of 52. He was giving them a shot in this game. But you can't win when your defense is giving up big plays and your offenses play offensive playmakers aren't making plays. It's a lot of problems to, to delve into a lot of issues. We're going to have all the grades on these guys very soon in the locked on Steelers podcast on the Tuesday episode. We're working on those right now. Cause I, I always like to do more of a film review before I do those than just coming off the riff of watching the game, rewatching certain parts to confirm whether I, what I thought about stuff and then going into my analysis. But by and large, this is a butt whooping. This is something that the Steelers need to pick themselves off the mat for. Can they do it again? They've done it so many times. It's looking, it's, it's looking rough. I do think that there's moxie to the team. I think that Kenny Pickett brings a different attitude. You saw I me. Mean, there was always the narrative last year that the Steelers offensive line didn't care much for Ben Roethlisberger because he would get knocked down and then people wouldn't rush to pick him up. You saw when Kenny Pickett slid and got hit after he slid that they, you know, James Daniels coming over and, and blowing up DeMar Hamlin and fighting half the Bills team on, on their sideline, you know, things like that. I also say the NFL officials let that game get way too out of hand. There were several late shots. You know, there were some that were illegal, some that were, weren't illegal, but dirty, just like, hey, like you don't need to pull that guy's knee that way when he's throwing the ball away and it's it's on the sideline and the ball is gone. Um, but, you know, there were there were times like you do that kind of stuff. It's going to encourage, you know, uh, the, the other team to defend themselves when you don't when you don't officiate. Well, I thought that was bad. But again, that had nothing to do with the final score. The Steelers still getting destroyed. They have a lot of questions to ask themselves. Somebody needs to step up and i do think that part that part of this needs to be the steelers coaches coming together and saying hey we got to put certain guys in certain situations this isn't about finding you know when we went into the season we talked about a balanced offense finding a way to spread the ball around to all these different playmakers it may come down to formulating game plans on specific game game play game player play playmakers because right now you don't have too many reliable ones Claypool and Johnson haven't lived up to the building. George Pickens has. You got to see if, if Patrick Firemuth's back. You got to see if Najee Harris is, a, is at full strength. Um, lots of questions. And again, that's where the Steelers are right now. But hang in there, Steelers fans. This is uh, this here. You're going through what a lot of teams have gone through and that you haven't had to go through. If you're a Steelers fan of my age, I'm 33 years old. Uh, I was born the last time that they had a beating this bad. And that was the 51 to zero loss to the Browns back in 1989. So, Again, I think that there's this this puts a lot of things into perspective for Steelers fans, but that doesn't mean that they have to accept this moving forward and they do have to find to find a way to rebound. We'll start about we'll talk about how they start to do that on tomorrow's episode of Locked On Steelers when I give out my grades. We'll also be talking about how, you know, who could be better, who might need to get you know exchanged as far as you know moving up the depth chart, down the depth chart, maybe looking to get some outside help. They still have eight, they have still have about eight million dollars in cap space, I believe. Maybe it's time for them to sit to find a way to use it before it's too late in this season. And who knows? Maybe it already is. Sorry to not have a more positive episode, but what you going to do when your team lose 33 that you got to cover? That's what it is here. Again, I'm Chris Carter of Locked On Steelers. Thanks again for checking out the podcast. I'm on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, and YouTube. If you're watching this video on YouTube, hit the like button. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hang in there, Steelers fans. I know it is rough. I'll be back tomorrow with my grades, more breakdowns, more analysis. Hopefully, we'll have some all 22 uh, review up by, on, on NFL's uh, NFL Plus, NFL Premium Plus, whatever they call that stuff. Now, it's basically game pads. We'll hopefully have some of that all 22 all set to go for you guys. I'm talking about that, but we will have a lot of great shows coming up for you all week long stay tuned thanks again follow me on twitter and instagram at carter critiques i'll be back on your screens and in your ears very soon mm -hmm.